Das Reich will go down in history as Germany's most decorated division throughout the entire war, boasting an unparalleled reputation for stability and consistency in its combat records within the Third Reich, renowned for its unwavering dedication to duty and exceptional performance on the battlefield. This division earned a plethora of decorations, solidifying its status as a symbol of German military prowess. Throughout the challenging and tumultuous periods of conflict, Das Reich exhibited remarkable resilience, demonstrating its ability to maintain a steady and reliable presence on various fronts. The division's consistent combat achievements became a testament to the discipline, training, strategic brilliance and unwavering commitment of its soldiers. Not only did Das Reich accumulate a remarkable number of individual and unit commendations, but it also consistently played a pivotal role in critical battles and campaigns, earning the respect of both allies and adversaries alike. Its soldiers became synonymous with courage, tenacity and a relentless pursuit of victory. As the war unfolded, Das Reich's reputation continued to soar, with its commanders and soldiers proving their mettle in diverse and challenging environments. This division became a symbol of the Third Reich's military might, showcasing the formidable capabilities and determination that characterized Germany's armed forces during this tumultuous period. Adolf Hitler made a strategic decision that would significantly shape the course of the Waffen-SS. He placed two key units, the Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler LSSAH, later renamed the SS Division Leibstandarte and the SS Verfügungstruppe, under the operational command of the High Command of the German Army. This move was a reflection of Hitler's desire to consolidate power and create a unified front within the German military. However, the effectiveness of the SSVT during the subsequent invasion of Poland became a subject of scrutiny. Doubts arose regarding their combat capabilities, prompting discussions on the role and structure of the Waffen-SS. Heinrich Himmler, a prominent figure within the SS, passionately advocated for the autonomy of the SS VT, arguing that it should fight in its own formations under its own commanders. In contrast, the OKW, the German Armed Forces High Command, pushed for the complete disbandment of the SS VT, questioning its overall contribution to military objectives. Caught in the middle of conflicting opinions, Hitler faced a delicate dilemma. Unwilling to upset either the established military hierarchy or Heinrich Himmler, who wielded significant influence, Hitler opted for a compromise. He issued a directive that allowed the SSVT to form its own divisions, but with a crucial caveat. These divisions would operate under the command of the German army. This decision sought to strike a balance between maintaining unity within the German military and appeasing the ambitions of the SS. As as the SSVT transitioned into forming its own divisions, one notable division that emerged during this period was the Der Führer Regiment or the SS Das Reich. This division, part of the Waffen-SS, would go on to play a significant role in various campaigns. Renowned for its elite status, Das Reich became emblematic of the formidable but controversial nature of the Waffen-SS within the broader context of World War II. The division's involvement in key military operations and also committing heinous crimes, but they showcased both its military prowess and the ongoing complexities surrounding the relationship between the regular army and the SS during this critical period in history. In October 1939, a significant development unfolded within the SS Verfügungstruppe. The regiments Deutschland, Germania and Der Führer were consolidated to form the SS Verfügungsdivision with one of the most notable German commanders, Paul Hauser. Hauser, born in Brandenburg and a Havel to a Prussian military family, had a significant military upbringing with his father, Kurt Hauser, serving as a major in the Imperial German Army. Paul Hauser commenced his military journey in 1892, attending the cadet school in Koslin until 1896. Subsequently, he pursued further education at the Cadet Academy Berlin Lichterfelder, successfully graduating in 1899. Upon receiving his commission as a lieutenant on March 20th, 1899, Hauser was stationed at Ostrowo in Posen with Infantry Regiment 155. His dedication and skills were evident as he assumed the role of adjutant for the regiment's 2nd Battalion on October 1st, 1903, serving in this capacity for five years until October 1908. 
Recognised for his military prowess, Hauser enrolled in the Prussian Military Academy in Berlin in October 1908, completing his studies and graduating on July 21, 1911. Throughout the First World War and beyond, from 1912 onward, he held various general staff assignments contributing to the significantly downsized post-war German army, known as the Reichswehr, where he attained the rank of colonel by 1927. Hauser's extensive military background and strategic contributions marked his notable career in service to Germany. On February 1st, 1931, Hauser achieved the rank of Major General, marking a significant milestone in his military career. Following this accomplishment, he decided to retire from the Reichswehr on January 31st, 1932, holding the distinguished rank of Lieutenant General at the time of his departure. Transitioning into civilian life, Hauser took an active role in the Stahlhelm organization, a right-wing group composed of World War I veterans. In 1933, he assumed leadership as the head of its Brandenburg-Berlin chapter. However, as political landscapes evolved, Stahlhelm merged with the SA Sturmabteilung, and subsequently, with the decline of the SA, it became integrated into the SS Schutzstaffel. In November 1934, Hauser underwent a significant shift in his military allegiance, transferring to the SS Verfügungstruppe and being assigned to SS Führerschule Braunschweig. His involvement in the SS continued to progress, as in 1935 he assumed the role of Inspector of SS Junkerschule and earned a promotion to the rank of Brigadeführer in 1936. These developments marked a notable phase in Hauser's post-military career as he embraced new responsibilities within the SS organization. Following these organizational changes in October 1939, the SSVT and the LSSAH actively engaged in intensive combat training. Operating under the command of the German army, both units underwent rigorous preparations for the impending military campaign known as Fall Gelb. This strategic initiative aimed to orchestrate the invasion against the Low Countries and France in 1940. During this crucial training phase, the collaboration between the Waffen-SS and the regular army reached a pinnacle. The joint efforts under army commands were a testament to the growing integration of the SSVT and the LSSAH into broader military strategies. The meticulous preparation and coordination were essential to ensure the seamless cooperation of these elite SS units alongside the German army during the upcoming large-scale offensive. The involvement of the SSVT and the LSSAH in combat training marked a pivotal period in their operational history. The rigorous exercises and manoeuvres undertaken by the SSVT, particularly in its formative years, played a foundational role in refining the combat capabilities of this elite paramilitary organisation. The emphasis on physical fitness, marksmanship, tactical proficiency and ideological commitment within the SSVT's training regimens laid the groundwork for the creation of a highly disciplined and skilled fighting force. The training experience of the SSVT was characterised by intensive physical conditioning, extensive marksmanship training and tactical proficiency drills. These elements were designed not only to develop individual skills but also to foster a sense of unit cohesion and shared purpose among the SSVT members. This period of rigorous preparation formed the backbone of the later Waffen-SS divisions. As for Gelb loomed on the horizon, the combat-ready SSVT and LSSAH units stood poised to make a significant impact in the theatres of the Low Countries and France. The coordinated efforts forged during this training period would soon be put to the ultimate test, shaping the narrative of the Waffen-SS's contribution to the unfolding events of World War II. In May 1940, the Der Führer Regiment undertook a pivotal role in the unfolding events near the Dutch border. 
As the division bided its time in Munster, anticipating the order to invade the Netherlands, the Der Fuhrer Regiment was strategically detached and relocated closer to the Dutch frontier. The stage was set for a momentous ground invasion, commencing on the 10th of May. During this intense campaign, the regiment, alongside the renowned LSSAH, played a crucial role in the Dutch invasion. Oberscharfuhrer Ludwig Keplinger, a non-commissioned officer in Der Fuhrer's 3rd Battalion, etched his name in history as as the first ever Waffen SS recipient of the Knight's Cross. Keplinger displayed exceptional courage during the assault across the Dutch border at Elten and the battalion's crossing over the Eisel near Arnhem. Leading just two men, Keplinger climbed over the demolished Eisel bridge with the objective of seizing the heavily fortified village of Westervoort, bristling with machine guns. Despite facing intense fire during the river crossing, Keplinger's determination led to a daring charge, utilising all available cover, resulting in the successful entry into the village. A fierce battle ensued between Keplinger's three-man team and the 90-man garrison. Through a relentless disregard for his own safety, Keplinger managed to force the surrender of Westervoort section by section. His remarkable soldierly courage, rarely surpassed on the battlefield, was evident in this operation. By 10am, Westervoort was under the control of the three SS men, overcoming the heavily armed villagers who had previously held a seemingly impenetrable position. Notably, there was no preparatory barrage or artillery support during the attack and without the ability to request such assistance, success seemed improbable. Yet Keplinger's leadership qualities defied the odds. One hour later, the 3rd Armed Battalion crossed the Eisel in force with Vestivor in their possession. The main strong point of the line had fallen into the hands of the three SS men, making the subsequent crossing of rubber boats supported by artillery against the remaining Westervoort positions only a matter of time. Without control of Westervoort, an attack across the Eisel by the Bataillon could have resulted in significant casualties. Keplinger's role as the leader of this operation rightfully earns him the title of the bravest NCO in the regiment. The regiment acknowledges the heroic achievement of these three SS men for achieving a breakthrough across the ISIL in a manner deemed impossible. In subsequent battles leading to the Greber position, Keplinger continued to distinguish himself as a Zugführer. Despite sustaining multiple wounds, he chose to remain on the battlefield, leading his Zug until fainting due to significant blood loss. After relinquishing command, he was promptly transported to the field hospital. Overall, Undeterred by the challenges, the regiment the Führer showcased its unparalleled fighting prowess. Pushing beyond Utrecht, the forces stormed through Amsterdam, advancing steadfastly to Zandvoort along the coast. The individual SSVT units forging a united front converged at Marienburg. As a cohesive division, they embarked on a relentless western march, determined to crush the Dutch resistance entrenched in Valcheren. The Dutch defenders, strategically positioned with artillery support and naval forces off the coast, presented a formidable challenge. The regiment Germany took the lead in the assault, facing severe casualties in the fierce encounter. Despite the valiant efforts, the battle culminated not in a triumphant German assault but in a tactical Dutch retreat. The formidable defensive position and resilient resistance on Valkyren proved to be a formidable obstacle, leading to a strategic shift in the course of the campaign. As a result, the SS Der Führer, or Das Reich, demonstrated exceptional performance during its inaugural operation in the Netherlands. The unit's proficiency and strategic fighting with the army on the battlefield showed us its formidable capabilities. As the SS Der Führer looks ahead to its next engagement, the stage is set for a challenging and important campaign in France. The momentum gained from its successful Dutch operation positions the division as a formidable force, ready to face the complexities of the upcoming conflict on the French front. The expectations are high and the SS de Führer is poised to exhibit further excellence and effectiveness in the impending battles that lie ahead.
On the fateful day of May 22nd, 1940, the SSVT division embarked on a critical mission, surging towards the strategic destination of Calais. As they advanced through the darkened landscapes, the echoes of impending conflict reverberated in the air. A night camp en route became the setting for a fierce encounter when French units, determined to break free from the encircling Dunkirk pocket, launched a surprise attack on the unsuspecting SS soldiers. In the cover of darkness, the clash erupted, marking an intense fight in the unfolding drama of World War II. The intensity of the skirmish was the desperation of the French forces seeking an escape route from the tightening grip of the Dunkirk ring. The battle was arduous, testing the mettle of both sides as they grappled for control in the shadows of the night. Undeterred by the unexpected assault, the SS VT division fought on. Despite the ferocity of the French offensive, the disciplined Das Reich soldiers stood their ground, turning the tide of the confrontation. With tenacity and strategic acumen, the SSVT regained the initiative, altering the course of the engagement. On May 24th, the renowned Liebstandarte Division, in conjunction with the SSVT Division, aka Das Reich, assumed a critical role in the defence and containment strategy around Dunkirk. Their mission was clear to secure the perimeter and diminish the size of the pocket enveloping the besieged British Expeditionary Force and French troops. During this crucial operation, a daring patrol from the SSVT Division undertook the perilous crossing of the canal at saint venant only to face the formidable resistance of British armour. The initial attempt resulted in the destruction of the SSVT patrol, highlighting the difficult challenge posed by the well-equipped British forces. Undeterred by the setback, the SSVT Division swiftly mobilised a larger force to cross the canal, successfully establishing a strategic bridgehead at saint venant positioned approximately 30 miles from the besieged Dunkirk. This bold manoeuvre not only showcased the Division's adaptability and resilience, but also marked a significant step in the broader effort to contain and control the situation around Dunkirk. The creation of the bridgehead at saint venant became a focal point in the complex chess game unfolding in the Dunkirk theatre. It demonstrated the SSVT Division's ability to adapt to changing circumstances and press forward in the face of adversity. The stage was set for further engagements, shaping the course of events in this critical chapter of the fight for France. The narrative unfolded rapidly on the subsequent day as British forces launched a counter-offensive against saint venant compelling the SSVT division to strategically retreat and yield ground in the face of the resolute opposition. The ebb and flow of the battle highlighted the dynamic nature of the conflict, with each side vying for control over the strategic location. However, the setback was but a momentary pause in the German advance. On May 26, the relentless momentum of the German forces resumed. By May 27th, Regiment Deutschland, a formidable component of the SSVT division, had arrived at the Allied defensive line situated along the Lyre River in Merville. They swiftly carved a bridgehead across the river, securing a crucial foothold in the ongoing campaign. The strategic importance of this achievement was further emphasised as Regiment Deutschland awaited the arrival of the SS Division Totenkopf. This collaboration aimed to fortify their position and cover the flank, creating a formidable united front against the Allied forces. The synchronised efforts of these elite SS divisions show the first coordinated and strategic approach employed by the German forces during this pivotal phase of the war. But things were not going to be this smooth. A critical juncture emerged when a unit of British tanks, swift and formidable, arrived first on the scene. Their advance posed a severe threat to the SSVT division's position, breaching the defences and penetrating deep into their lines. In the face of this sudden and perilous development, the SSVT managed to hold the ground, steadfastly holding the positions against the onslaught of British tank forces. The intensity of the struggle reached a very close call when the British tanks advanced to within a mere 15 feet of Commander Felix Steiner's position. The situation teetered on the brink of disaster for the SSVT until the timely intervention of the Totenkopf Panzerjäger platoon. 
Their arrival marked a crucial turning point, preventing the potential destruction of the regiment and ensuring the preservation of the hard-won bridgehead. The Totenkopf Panzerjäger's swift and effective response shows the importance of coordinated and timely support in the heat of battle. By May 30th, the relentless German advance had pushed the majority of the remaining Allied forces back into the confines of Dunkirk. The evacuation of these beleaguered troops by sea to England marked the end of a chapter in the Dunkirk campaign. With this success under their belt, the SSVT division seamlessly transitioned to the next phase of their wartime duties, actively participating in the drive towards Paris. On June 1st, recognising the need to regroup and prepare for the second phase of the campaign, the SSVT division was withdrawn from the front line. This brief respite allowed the division to reorganise its forces and gear up for the impending second phase of the Battle of France. Just four days later, the SSVT initiated the second chapter of the campaign by heading south through Orléans and subsequently occupying Angoulême. In this subsequent phase, the division found itself primarily engaged in the meticulous task of clearing and securing areas previously overrun by retreating French troops. This operation continued until the armistice was declared on June 25th. Remarkably, the SS soldiers exhibited both efficiency and great coordination, capturing over 30,000 prisoners at the cost of fewer than 35 men lost in action. The valour and effectiveness displayed by the SSVT division during this phase of the Battle of France did not go unnoticed. Several members of the SS Verfugungs division were duly honoured with the Knight's Cross. In June 1940, the SSVT division underwent a strategic relocation to occupied Holland, where it remained for several months in anticipation of Operation Sea Lion, the ambitious plan for the invasion of Great Britain. However, as Operation Sea Lion was indefinitely postponed, the division shifted back to France, marking a period of transition and adaptation. During this interlude, the division experienced the departure of some of its most seasoned members, who played a crucial role in forming the core of the newly established SS Wicking Division. This transfer of expertise highlighted the dynamic nature of military units during this phase. In December 1940, a significant reorganisation took place as the entire Germania Regiment was was withdrawn. In its stead, the SS Totenkopf Infantry Regiment 11 assumed the role, signalling a restructuring within the division's ranks. By the end of the month, a notable transformation was formalised as the division underwent an official renaming, becoming the SS Division Reich. Or Das Reich, this renaming reflected the evolving nature of the division's mission and its symbolic alignment with the broader goals of the German war effort. The SS Division Reich maintained its presence in France until March 1941, at which point it underwent a significant relocation to the Balkans. In the ensuing Balkans campaign, the division played a major role in the invasion of Yugoslavia. Notably, a small but daring motorcycle reconnaissance unit comprised of merely 10 men under the command of SS Hauptsturmführer Fritz Klingenberg. On the morning of April 12, 1941, SS Hauptsturmführer Fritz Klingenberg and his motorcycle assault company approached Belgrade from Panchevo along the Danube River's bank. Despite Klingenberg's eagerness to enter the city, the swollen river and the absence of usable bridges posed a significant obstacle, especially given the lack of bridging equipment or rafts within the motorcycle assault company. Undeterred, Klingenberg's resourceful men discovered a motor launch on the north bank of the Danube. With one platoon leader, two sergeants and five privates, Klingenberg embarked on a daring crossing of the Danube. Upon reaching the opposite bank, he dispatched two men back for reinforcements, proceeding with the remaining six into downtown Belgrade. Upon entering the city, Klingenberg's group encountered a contingent of 20 Yugoslavian soldiers who, without resistance, surrendered to the Germans. Subsequently, a convoy of military vehicles approached, resulting in a brief skirmish that ended with the Germans capturing the vehicles. Now motorised, the assault group set its sights on the Yugoslavian War Ministry. However, upon arrival, they found the building abandoned, likely evacuated during the earlier Luftwaffe bombardment. 
With no military command left in Belgrade, Klingenberg redirected his efforts to the German embassy, which had remained operational. Unfurling a large swastika, the Germans symbolically raised it over the embassy to proclaim the city's capture. Two hours later, the mayor of Belgrade arrived at the embassy, formally surrendering the city to Klingenberg. It wasn't until the following day that a substantial German force arrived to secure the city. For his instrumental role in capturing Belgrade under such challenging circumstances, SS Hauptsturmführer Fritz Klingenberg was honoured with the Knight's Cross, recognising his exceptional leadership and bravery during this daring and successful operation. It is insane how one man and a very small group made the entire country surrender. This is another example of how this Das Reich was on the finest and decorated division of the entire war. As it turns out when the mayor arrived to talk with Klingenberg, Klingenberg employed a strategic bluff when dealing with the mayor, convincingly portraying himself as the commander of a formidable army positioned just outside the city limits. In a clever ruse, he asserted that this sizable force was poised to receive his orders for an imminent air raid on Belgrade before launching a full-scale assault. This fabricated narrative, coupled with the apparent threat of impending bombardment, effectively coerced the mayor into surrendering the Yugoslav capital, and that is how one man made the capital capitulate. Following its success in Yugoslavia, the Division Das Reich set its sights on a monumental and pivotal endeavour, the invasion of the Soviet Union. At the outset of Operation Barbarossa, the division became an integral part of Army Group Centre, led by Field Marshal Fedor von Bock as they launched a colossal offensive against the nation. Unlike some units in the initial wave of the invasion, the SS Reich Division did not participate immediately. When it eventually entered the fray in the invasion of the Soviet Union, it encountered significant challenges. The progress of the division was hindered by the poor conditions of the roads, which were not only in disrepair but also overwhelmed with congestion. This logistical bottleneck slowed the advance of the division as it navigated through the difficult terrain, reflecting the immense challenges faced by the German forces during the early stages of the Eastern Front campaign. The Division des Reich experienced its first ever combat with the Soviets on June 28, 1941, with a significant engagement in Stasica. During this operation, the Division successfully expelled Russian troops from the area. However, the triumph was nearly overshadowed by the perilous situation faced by the advancing German forces. An impending enemy Soviet counterattack threatened to cut off the forward units from the main force. In the face of this imminent danger, the division's advanced troops found themselves in a precarious position. The timely arrival of reinforcements saved the division, averting potential disaster and preventing the encirclement of the German forces. This episode shows the volatile and unpredictable nature of the Eastern Front, where swift and well-coordinated counter-attacks by the Soviet forces posed continuous challenges to the German advance, especially to the elite divisions. Following its initial engagement, the SS Division Reich continued its advance into the heart of Russia. Negotiating the challenging terrain, the division crossed the formidable Berezina River, navigating through the notorious Pripyat swamps on its way to Mogilev and Smolensk. The troops exhibited resilience and determination as they seized Yelania, steadfastly holding it against vigorous counter-attacks from the determined Soviet forces. As of August 8th, recognising the strain on the division, it was temporarily relieved from active duty to undergo a much needed period of rest and re-equipment. This strategic decision aimed to ensure the physical and material readiness of the SS Division Reich for the ongoing and future challenges of the Eastern Front campaign. The respite near Smolensk provided an opportunity for the division to regroup, replenish its resources and prepare for the demanding battles that lay ahead in the vast expanse of the Soviet Union. In September, the SS Division Das Reich once more found itself at the forefront of the Eastern Front, actively participating in the advance that led to the capture of Sosnitsa. This strategic achievement played a crucial role in closing the infamous Kiev Pocket, a momentous event in the historical context of World War II. 
The SS Division Reich, with its disciplined and battle-hardened troops, demonstrated exceptional prowess during the fighting in and around Sosnitsa. Engaging in intense and fierce combat, the division contributed significantly to the successful closure of the Kiev pocket. This monumental operation resulted in the capture of an astounding 665,000 Red Army soldiers marking one of the largest mass surrenders in the military history. After a brief respite and the reinforcement of losses, the SS Division Reich played a substantial role in Operation Typhoon, the ambitious advance towards Moscow. To the German High Command, this war could be over very soon. A strike on the capital was now imminent, commencing on October 19th. The division's involvement in this critical offensive marked a big moment in the Eastern Front campaign during World War II. The division faced significant challenges during Operation Typhoon, particularly in the aftermath of the capture of Gzhazk along the railway line to Moscow. The strategic importance of this location demanded a robust defence against fierce and relentless counter-attacks from the determined Soviet forces. Undeterred, the SS Division Reich pressed forward in the harsh winter conditions, capturing key objectives such as Mosiask and Istra. By early December, elements of the division had advanced as far as Lenino, a suburb of Moscow. From this vantage point, the soldiers beheld the unmistakable dome-shaped roofs of the Kremlin, symbolising the proximity of their forces to the heart of the Soviet capital. However, the formidable force of General Winter had now manifested itself in full strength, posing a massive challenge for the German forces. Despite the considerable losses suffered by the SS Division Das Reich and the exhaustion of the German offensive's momentum, the undying determination of the Red Army soldiers to defend their capital, combined with the harsh winter conditions, prompted a shift from the German advance to a defensive stance. Moscow, seemingly within grasp, remained elusive as the German troops were compelled to transition from the offensive. Units of the SS Division Reich found themselves approximately 10 miles from the city centre itself, their advance halted by the combined impact of the harsh winter and fierce resistance from the determined Soviet defenders. The toll on the division was heavy, with only 40% of its original combat strength said to have survived at that point heavy battles underway. The Soviets were smashing the line so hard that the Germans had to retreat, Das Reich suffered, and this was the first time Das Reich would be fighting in house to house while holding villages around the Moscow sector. This marked a very important turning point in the Eastern Front campaign, with Moscow symbolising the ultimate objective that remained just out of reach. The brutal winter conditions, coupled with the resilience of the Red Army, had shifted the dynamics of the conflict, setting the stage for a protracted and challenging defensive struggle for the German forces on the Eastern Front. The debilitated SS Division Reich found itself vulnerable to intense Russian assaults as the Red Army initiated its winter counter-offensive. The Führer Regiment, a once formidable and elite unit, now comprised fewer than 50 frontline soldiers. Despite their exhaustion, these resilient soldiers clung to the ground under the relentless pressure of Russian attacks. Eventually, the division, barely holding its ground, had no choice but to retreat to the region of Gashatsk and Vyazma. The division mounted counter-attacks in January and March 1942. Launching these operations from north of Sikhevka, the division aimed to regain control and close the gap southwest of the city of Varzhev. This marked a period of active engagement as the division sought to reclaim lost ground and confront the challenges posed by the harsh Russian winter and the formidable Red Army. By the end of February, the SS Division Reich existed in name only, reduced to a combat group. Engaging in intense fighting along the Volga from March to April, the division steadfastly held its positions against relentless enemy pressure. Only when the intensity of the opposition finally subsided were the remnants of the division afforded a much-needed respite. 
Following this period of rest, the division was ultimately withdrawn from the Eastern Front. It underwent a transformative shift as it was relocated to Germany and reconfigured into a Panzergrenadier division. Despite this reclassification, the division retained a structure and equipment that closely resembled a fully-fledged tank division. This adaptation reflected the fluidity of wartime divisions, adjusting to the evolving needs and challenges of the conflict on the Eastern Front. The SS Division Riker's journey so far shows us both the resilience of its forces and the strategic adaptability required for sustained engagement in the complex and dynamic theatre of war. From August 1942 to January 1943, the SS Panzergrenadier Division Das Reich underwent a deployment in France, primarily assigned to occupation service duties. During this period, the division played an active role in the occupation of Vichy, France, a significant event that unfolded in November 1942. As part of the occupation forces, the division was involved in maintaining control, enforcing policies, and overseeing the administration of the occupied territories. This period of service in France marked a shift in the division's operational focus, transitioning from the intense and dynamic Eastern Front to the responsibilities associated with occupying and governing conquered territories. After undergoing reorganization into the SS Panzergrenadier Division Das Reich, essentially transforming into a fully-fledged Panzer Division, the unit was redeployed to the Eastern Front. The division found itself immediately thrust into intense combat, defending the strategic city of Kharkov. The offensive commenced on February 19th, as the SS Das Reich initiated a southward push from their positions near Poltava, seizing Novomoskovsk on the Samara River by February 20th. Swiftly advancing, they approached Pavlograd the next day, posing a threat to the Soviet flank and effectively isolating a substantial number of Soviet troops south of the Samara. The division not only decimated additional Soviet units, but also forced the remaining forces to retreat northward, crossing the Samara River. Simultaneously, the SS Totenkopf, newly deployed to the front, shadowed the SS Das Reich along a parallel course to the left, maintaining a position north of the Samara. On February 23rd, both divisions executed a coordinated eastward turn, facing dwindling fuel and supplies, the Soviet forces persisted in tenacious defence, although some infantry units were holding on precariously. SS Das Reich, engaging in intense street fighting, secured Lozovaya on February 26th. Two days later, the 17th Panzer Division captured Petrovskoye. In a desperate attempt, the remnants of Mobile Group Popov and units of the 1st Guards Army made a stand against the 1 Panzer Army near Bavankoyo, resulting in the Soviet forces being decisively defeated. The strategic plan unfolded as SS Das Reich attacked from the west, SS Leibstandarte advanced from the north, and SS Totenkopf screened the northwest. Kampfgruppers were formed, each assigned a specific road for their assault. Kampfgruppe Hamel encountered fierce resistance along its route, but managed to reach the Kharkov suburb of Zalutino by 1600. At this point, they faced a significant obstacle, an anti-tank ditch covered by anti-tank guns and artillery. Meanwhile, the rest of Das Reich, situated to the south of Kharkov, severed the Soviets from the Marefa Road. In the tumultuous battle of Kharkov, the combat unfolded with unparalleled intensity, each street witnessing a brutal and bloody struggle. Advancing methodically, Das Reich gained a decisive upper hand, systematically overcoming the Soviet defences. The once resilient Soviet line succumbed, paving the way for a relentless onslaught by Das Reich forces. Amidst the harsh and tumultuous terrain, the entire cityscape was shrouded in smoke, reflecting the ferocity of the conflict. Das Reich's tanks spearheaded the assault, with grenadiers methodically clearing Soviet positions. House by house, it was intense. Amidst the battle, Hauser, receiving orders from Hoth, faced a critical decision. Although directed to detach Das Reich from the Kharkov assault and redirect the division northeast, Hauser argued that the risk of breaking off mid-battle was too high, and delays in the heavily forested areas to the north were too prolonged. Instead, he opted to send a detachment from Totenkopf to cover the northeast. 
By late afternoon, the entirety of Das Reich had departed Kharkov for the north, with only SS Sturmbannführer Bissinger's IE, Battalion of SS Panzergrenadier Regiment Deutschland persisting in sweeping through the southwest of the city, encountering minimal resistance. While there remained substantial cleanup operations, the German offensive persisted. On March 15th, fighting erupted in the factory district southeast of the city, and Kampfgruppe Kum of Das Reich assaulted the massive tractor factory complex from the south, successfully clearing it of resistance by March 16th. For outstanding leadership of the 2nd Panzer Company of Das Reich during this period, Christian Tyson was awarded the Knight's Cross on the 31st, a distinction also bestowed upon Karl Heinz Werthmann. In April, Ostaf Karl Heinz Lorenz, recognised with the German Cross in gold as the commander of the 2nd Panzer Company, joined the staff of the 2nd Panzer Abteilung. Simultaneously, Stuff Herbert Zimmermann assumed command of the Tiger Company. Werthmann's promotion to Untersturmführer Ustuf marked his appointment as the commander of the 6th Panzer Company. Meanwhile, Klokowski transitioned to the 7th Panzer Company, taking on the role of its 3rd platoon leader. This triumph marked a pivotal moment for the Waffen-SS, achieving even greater significance with the successful recapture of Belgorod. The satisfaction derived from this accomplishment was heightened by its distinction as Hitler's most substantial victory in quite some time. Notably, this triumph served as the catalyst for the subsequent and swift expansion of the Waffen-SS, witnessing the establishment of numerous new divisions that would further bolster their military prowess. The recapture of Belgorod not only secured a strategic stronghold, but also solidified the Waffen-SS's influence, setting the stage for an era of remarkable growth and heightened operational capabilities. From April to the onset of July 1943, the soldiers of the Das Reich Division underwent a period of recovery before being thrust back into the intense theatre of the Battle of Kursk. Operating as a vital component of the SS-2 Tank Corps under the command of General Hoth's 4th Army, Das Reich executed a strategic invasion into the southern portion of the Front Bulge, effectively safeguarding the right flank of the Corps. However, the operational landscape proved challenging as torrential rains had transformed the roads into virtually impassable mud tracks. This adverse condition compelled the Panzergrenadiers of Das Reich to forge ahead without crucial tank support, exposing them to the rigours of fierce close combat. Despite these obstacles, the strategic deployment of Stukas played a pivotal role in assisting Das Reich in achieving its initial operational objectives, particularly securing the town of Berezov and its commanding heights. This phase of the campaign highlighted the division's resilience and adaptability in the face of challenging environmental conditions as they navigated through muddy terrains and engaged in intense combat to fulfil their military objectives. Nevertheless, the resolve of Russian resistance intensified swiftly, subjecting the SS soldiers to artillery barrages and airstrikes from enemy aircraft. In the face of such staunch opposition, Das Reich pressed forward with remarkable progress. However, the division, particularly at Prokhorovka, faced a formidable Soviet counter-attack that challenged their gains. Undeterred, Das Reich tenaciously held its ground against the adversary, fortified by the support of General von Richthofen's Ju-87 tank busters. Collaborating with fellow Waffen-SS divisions within the 2nd SS Tank Corps, they successfully neutralised over 300 enemy tanks. Despite overcoming the initial counter-attack, Das Reich's advance persisted, culminating in their involvement in the renowned tank battle in the hills surrounding Prokhorovka on July 12th. Subsequent days witnessed a gruelling attrition battle, with both sides grappling for supremacy but experiencing minimal gains in terrain. The toll on human lives and tanks was severe on both fronts, yet the Red Army's capacity to replace losses contrasted sharply with the Waffen-SS divisions, especially Das Reich, which did not enjoy such replenishment luxuries. In this protracted engagement, the Russian losses, though greater than those incurred by the Germans, were offset by their ability to replenish their forces. Conversely, the Waffen-SS divisions, including Das Reich, 
faced the grim reality of sustaining their operations with diminishing resources, illustrating the challenging dynamics of the battlefield after a hell of a fierce fight, Das Reich was ordered to fall back immediately. Following the Allied invasion of Sicily, the demand for German divisions in the West prompted a shift in strategy, prompting Das Reich to transition from an offensive to a defensive stance. Throughout the latter half of 1943, the division found itself engaged in numerous intense battles along the Mius River, once again tasked with the defence of cities it had previously conquered. Battles were very hard, outnumbered most of the time, it was becoming a fight of attrition for Das Reich, but still performing very well. By mid-July, Das Reich relocated from the area west of Belgorod. Subsequent to this move, counter-attacks and defensive struggles ensued along the Mius Donez region, followed by engagements near Stepanoka and Marinoka in the vicinity of Stalino. The months of August and September 1943 witnessed a continuation of defensive operations, counter-attacks and battles in the Kharkov and Poltava areas. The division's responsibilities extended to a strategic retreat over the Dnieper River, where they faced further counter-attacks and defensive encounters in the Dnieper Bo region. Over a span of five months, Das Reich experienced a relentless series of setbacks, reaching its nadir with the significant loss of Kiev in November. As 1943 drew to a close, the division found itself reduced to the strength of a combat group. Consequently, in an effort to regroup and re-equip, the initial elements of Das Reich were transported to France. By the conclusion of April 1944, the entirety of the division had been withdrawn from the Eastern Front, marking a strategic shift in focus and the commencement of a period dedicated to recovery and reorganisation in preparation for future engagements. As of October 22, 1943, the division underwent a transformation, being redesignated as the 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich and subsequently re-equipped and replenished in southern France. Notably, during the spring of 1944, the 1st Panzer Abteilung tank detachment underwent a significant upgrade, transitioning to Panzer V Panther tanks. Simultaneously, the Heavy Panzer Company underwent a restructuring, emerging as the formidable Heavy Panzer Abteilung 101 equipped with Tiger tanks. Moreover, advancements in firepower were witnessed within the Panzer Artillery Regiment 2R, which now incorporated self-propelled howitzers into its arsenal. This period of reorganisation and modernisation signified the division's commitment to adapting to evolving battlefield dynamics and enhancing its combat capabilities. While stationed in southern France, the forces of the 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich found themselves occasionally engaged in anti-partisan operations. Shaped by the harsh realities of prolonged combat experience on the Eastern Front, the troops harboured a reluctance to tolerate losses at the hands of the French resistance, often communist partisans. The response to any harm inflicted on German personnel or damage to vehicles was frequently marked by a brutal and unforgiving retaliation, reflecting the battle-hardened mindset of the division which had endured the harsh conditions of warfare in the east, but I will go more into this later in the video. Upon the Allied landing in Normandy on June 6, 1944, the division received orders to relocate from its stationed area near Bordeaux to the front lines. This journey was marred by frequent acts of sabotage and raids, eliciting a furious response from the SS troops. In a grim reprisal for the death of approximately 40 German soldiers, 99 civilians in Toulé fell victim to execution by the enraged SS forces. The abduction of SS Sturmbannführer Helmut Kampfer, the commander of the 3rd battalion of the regiment De Führer by the resistance marked a turning point. This event triggered the horrifying destruction of the tranquil town of orador sur glane near Limoges, resulting in the ruthless murder of 640 civilians. Men, women and children bore the brunt of the brutality orchestrated by the 3rd Company of the 1st Battalion of the Regiment under the leadership of SS Hauptsturmführer Kahn and the battalion commander SS Obersturmbahnführer Otto Dickmann. 
The dark episode exemplifies the atrocities committed in the name of retaliation, leaving an indelible scar on the history of Oradour sur Glane. Upon reaching the invasion front on June 16th, 17, Das Reich encountered logistical challenges as parts of the division were still en route from the south. Consequently, the division found itself divided, with its units allocated to various army formations. Primarily, these units were actively engaged in combat against British forces in the Cairn area, heavy battles were now underway, and from here we now see Das Reich fight once again against the British forces. In Normandy, a very notable moment unfolded, where one of the division's most renowned soldiers achieved a historic triumph. SS Oberscharfuhrer Ernst Barkmann, at the helm of a single Panzer V Panther, took up a strategic position at an intersection in Le Lore. His vigilant watch paid off when a formidable column, comprising at least 14 enemy tanks along with trucks, emerged on the scene. In the ensuing battle, Barkman and his crew displayed exceptional prowess, incapacitating eight Sherman tanks and demolishing several trucks, including crucial fuel vehicles. Despite the intervention of Allied fighter bombers that inflicted damage on his tank during the combat, Barkman held his ground, only retreating when he exhausted his ammunition. This remarkable feat stands as a testament to the skill of SS Oberschaffuhrer Ernst Barkman, putting his name into the annals of historical battle successes for the division. Das Reich Division found itself deeply embroiled in the fierce battles aimed at thwarting the breakout attempts of US troops from the invasion area around St. Lo. By mid-August, a significant number of German units became trapped within the Falaise pocket. The situation was dire. Remarkably, Das Reich emerged as one of the units successful in breaking through the containment ring imposed by Canadian and Polish troops. It was brutal, and the toll was heavy. Very brutal fighting was underway, their breakthrough efforts played a massive role in opening an escape route for other encircled German troops. Das Reich performed again very well in Normandy, however, there are also some very important losses for the division. We mentioned Christian Tyksen earlier on during the fighting at Kharkov, a very notable figure in Das Reich and one tough soldier. After being wounded more than nine times in total, he was killed in Normandy when the Kubelwagen, which he was in with a driver and an NCO, was fired upon by an advancing American tank. He died. American looters took his tunic with all his decorations and all other types of identification, so he was buried as an unknown soldier but was later identified years later. Following engagements in Normandy, Das Reich executed a strategic withdrawal to the Seine and valiantly resisted at the Rouen bridgehead. By August 28, 1944, the division had successfully retreated across the Seine. The subsequent retreat route led them through Vermand, across the Meuse south of Namur, and involved defensive actions along the Meuse around Hougivet until September 7, 1944. A subsequent retreat positioned Das Reich behind the formidable Siegfried Line, where defensive battles, unfolded amidst the snow-covered Eiffel region and at the West Wall. Commencing on October 23, 1944, relief efforts were initiated at the front, ultimately completed by mid-November. Das Reich underwent rejuvenation in the Sauerland region south of Paderborn, with the noteworthy addition of many conscripts from the Wehrmacht. This infusion, however, marked a discernible decline in the overall quality of the division's original troops, and much of Das Reich started to lose its elite status. In mid-December, Das Reich was redeployed to the Euskirchen area, gearing up for participation in the Battle of the Bulge. The division launched its offensive on December 20th, advancing through the Barak de Frechua crossroads and encircling American troops at St. Vith. Similar to other German units, Das Reich grappled with challenges such as a scarcity of fuel and ammunition, necessitating the traversal of heavy tanks through unsuitable routes. Despite these logistical hindrances, the division successfully secured vital positions, including Manhay and Grand Mesnil. However, these triumphs proved short-lived as both villages succumbed to determined American counter-attacks. 
Panzer Ace Ernst Barkman further enhanced his impressive track record by eliminating an additional 15 Sherman tanks during these engagements. Notably, nine of these American tanks were simply abandoned by their crews when confronted by Barkman's lone tank, highlighting the psychological impact of his formidable presence on the battlefield. Until January 17, 1945, Das Reich remained engaged in defensive operations in the Magosta and Makor area. Subsequently, the division was relieved from frontline duties and withdrew behind the Siegfried Line, west wall to Koblenz. In this strategic relocation, the division underwent a brief period of refreshment and recovery, preparing for potential future engagements. Despite being in a state of incomplete revitalization and lacking full equipment, Das Reich was relocated to Army Group South near Lake Balaton during the period from February 8 to 15, 1945. In this fresh theatre of action, the division finalised its replenishment efforts. Commencing from March 6, Das Reich played a role in the concluding and desperate German offensive on the Eastern Front, famously dubbed Operation Frühlingserwachen, or Spring Awakening. The primary objective of this undertaking was to secure the last remaining oil fields in the region, signifying the critical importance of this late-stage effort in the waning months of the war. Das Reich launched an offensive on the eastern bank of the Sarvis Canal, making significant progress and reaching the area north of Sarkarez Tour by March 12, 1945. However, the offensive encountered formidable challenges as it grappled with the treacherous conditions of the spring storm, plunging into deep mud that brought the advance to a complete standstill. Within a mere 10 days, a resolute Russian counter-offensive thwarted Das Reich's momentum, highlighting the formidable obstacles presented by both the weather and the determined enemy forces. Until March 18th, the division assumed a defensive posture in the vicinity of Abakoloz. However, following a breakthrough by the Russian forces, Das Reich was detached from the front. The division then embarked on a departure to the eastern shore of Lake Nosedal, culminating in a retreat to the southern outskirts of Vienna by March March 27th. This strategic manoeuvre aimed at regrouping and adapting to the evolving dynamics of the Eastern Front during this critical phase of the war. Das Reich undertook the defence of crucial bridges spanning the Danube at the eastern edge of Vienna, engaging in intense house-to-house -house combat in the suburbs as the Red Army penetrated the area. The battles were bloody. The division's units focused their efforts around the Floristdorf Bridge until April 9th, attempting to stave off the advancing forces in extremely brutal fighting. Subsequently, Das Reich found itself in battle east of Melk before embarking on a march towards the region between Prague and Dresden on April 26, 1945. The dwindling number of remaining tanks played a critical role in covering the retreat, although they were ultimately destroyed upon reaching the city due to depleted fuel and ammunition reserves. This marked the final chapter of Das Reich's wartime endeavours as the division grappled with resource constraints in the face of the advancing Allied forces. Meanwhile, the Führer Regiment dedicated its final days of the war to the rescue of German civilians, Wehrmacht auxiliaries, women and wounded soldiers in Prague. Following a hard-fought entry into the city, Regimental Commander Otto Weidinger and his troops guided them to Rocket Chennai in Bohemia, where they found a measure of relative security in US captivity until May 8th. The majority of Das Reich's members survived their time in US captivity. Unfortunately, for those who ended up in Russian or Czech hands, their fate was far grimmer. Many were either executed immediately or met their demise during the protracted years spent in Soviet labour camps. Throughout the entire war, a remarkable total of 72 members of the division were honoured with the Knight's Cross, marking the highest number of such awards within all German formations throughout the conflict. This recognition was the exceptional valour and achievements demonstrated by Das Reich's members on the battlefield, making it a distinguished and decorated unit within the German military during World War II. Das Reich Division emerges as a nuanced and controversial chapter in the annals of history. Acclaimed for its elite status and military prowess, the division played a massive role across various theatres of conflict.
However, its historical legacy is marred by the perpetration of war crimes, including heinous acts against civilians. Despite this troubling dichotomy of being both a powerful military force and a participant in reprehensible actions, the Das Reich division remains a subject of historical significance and scholarly debate across many, but we must give combat respect where it is due, it's a difficult one, but I am glad I was able to show you the full history of this entire division. As always, crafting this content was truly enjoyable and I trust you've gained some valuable insights. Remember to check out our Instagram where I post much more content daily and my Patreon where you can support me further. If you found this engaging, don't forget to smash that subscribe button, it makes a significant difference in our quest to glean wisdom from history. Your support is appreciated and until our next exploration bid you farewell. Until then, take care and goodbye for now.